Today, we continue our discussion of prophecies on the Messiah. And, of course, on that plane, our previous session, which concerned more generally the fulfillment of the words of the prophets generally, is an especially critical background for what we'll be discussing today. Obviously, we're not going to belabor that discussion excessively because we have to move on. But I do feel it's important for us to, at the very least, recall one critical principle that we discussed last time, in particular, in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth, says God through the prophet. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in that for which I sent it. So, of course, to that extent, we emphatically maintain all of God's words through the prophets are fulfilled. Of course, inevitably, we recognize there are different types of fulfillment. And it is on that plane, in considering what the fulfillment means, that we elaborated at very great length in our last session, in recognizing, first of all, that there are prophecies that could have been fulfilled at their time. We discussed in particular the prophets at the beginning of the Second Temple period, but because we weren't ready. Israel wasn't ready. The world wasn't ready. Those prophecies remained only partially actualized with the ultimate fulfillment, we firmly believe, that was shaped for the future, the time of the coming of the Messiah, the final redemption of the world. There are, indeed, prophecies that in a superficial sense aren't fulfilled at all. As we noted, prophecies that speak of punishment, if those who are the designated recipients of that punishment repent and return to God, the obvious Example here, most blatantly, is the people of Nineveh in the prophecy of Jonah. Jonah. But then, recalling what Isaiah states in the verses that we cited, we recognize that that's precisely what God's word was intended to do. To inspire them to repent, to return to God. That was the fulfillment, that just as the rain and snow descend from heaven and don't return there without having accomplished their purpose, making the earth bud and bring forth its produce, God's word necessarily will bring forth its produce, either in the actualization of God's designated word or a deeper message, the message of returning to God the message of repentance that is indeed ultimately the fulfillment of God's word through the prophet Yonah, through Jonah, and, of course, through many, many others. Ultimately, of course, what this highlights is what is of such critical importance for us to stress in our studying the words of the Bible, and that is the impact that they are to have, ultimately, of course, most of all, upon us. And 
that point in itself demands of us to recall a subject that we have discussed, admittedly, in other contexts. In particular, we discussed this in our introduction to the course on the visions of Isaiah, when we considered what the difference is between the words of the prophets, from our perspective, and the words of the Torah, the five books of Moses. Because certainly, as presented in the Torah, there is a qualitative difference between the prophecy of Moses and the prophecy of the other prophets. Now, admittedly, this is something we discussed at fairly great length in that introductory session. We're not going to repeat it now. You are invited to consider the ideas in full in that session. For our purposes at present, we'll consider it sufficient to cite just one verse that dramatizes the point. It is indeed the third from last verse in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, and there arose no prophet anymore in Israel like Moses, whom God knew face to face. That level of prophecy isn't replicated in any of the other prophets. And it has crucial implications insofar as how we relate to the word of God in the prophecy of Moses in the Torah, the five books of Moses, and how we relate to God's word as expressed by the prophets. Specifically, at Moses' level of prophecy, we regard what is recorded in the five books of Moses as literally a dictation. God's word directly communicated to us through him. And of course, necessarily that means that as God isn't bounded by time, God transcends time. God's word in the Torah transcends time as well. Of course, we recognize that the Torah was given as an historical event. The event, the giving of the Torah at Sinai. But the content of what is given is as directly applicable, as directly relevant to us today as it was then and as it will be at any time in the future. Of course, the modes of expression may reflect certain aspects of the world as it was then, but the message, the instruction. We've noted on many occasions that the word Torah, frequently mistranslated as law, means instruction. The instruction of the Torah is eternal, and it applies to all generations equivalently. It's important for us to consider in that context how we relate to the words of the prophets. Of course, on some plane, the ultimate goal of the words of the prophets is the eventual fulfillment of the words of the Torah. And of course, in this regard, we consider the third from last verse of the prophets. The third from last verse of the last of the prophets of Malachi in Malachi chapter 3, verse 22. Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Chorev at Sinai for all Israel, statutes and judgments. Remember the Torah of Moses. The prophets are intended to fulfill the words contained in the Torah, 
given by Moses. They don't initiate in a legal sense in the same way that Moses presents to us the laws of God by dictation in the Torah. But furthermore, and for our purposes especially today, it's especially important for us to consider the relationship of the words of the prophets to the time the circumstances in which they were stated. That is, on the one hand, we emphatically maintain all of the words of the prophets that are recorded in the Bible have a message for us, a message for us no less than a message for all the previous generations going back to the generation that heard those words initially from the prophet. If that were not the case, those words would not have been recorded in the Bible. That is, it is axiomatic to us that there were many, many prophets of whom we know absolutely nothing because they remained anonymous and their words were not recorded in the Bible for all generations. Just consider, as a case in point, in the first book of Kings, in chapter 18, we read of the life-saving enterprise of Ovadiah in saving a remnant of the prophets of God from the sword of Ezebel, of Jezebel. In chapter 18, verse 4, so it was when Ezebel and Jezebel cut off the prophets of God that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. A hundred prophets. The remnant that was saved. And we know nothing about any of them. The only prophet whom we know by name from that period wasn't in the cave. It was Prophet Elijah, Eliyahu. So there are all these prophets of whom we know nothing. Because while their words may have been of critical importance in their time, their words were not deemed to have critical messages for all generations. The prophecies that are recorded in the Bible are precisely that. Prophecies that have messages that are indeed needed by all generations. But here we need to draw a subtle but very important distinction. We described the Torah as eternal instruction, as directly relevant to our generation as any other. We speak of the words of the prophets, those that are recorded in the Bible, as necessary for all generations, but we don't speak of them as eternal instruction in the same sense as the Torah. To appreciate that distinction, Again, I'm going to reiterate, the words of the Torah in our belief are directly timeless in nature, directed then for each and every generation equivalently. The words of the prophets were articulated by the prophets themselves, articulated in a set of circumstances, articulated for a particular audience, the prophet's contemporaries. The words that are recorded in the prophets then are time-bounded. And yet, while they are time-bounded, simultaneously, that time-boundedness is paradoxically the key to their timelessness.
What I mean by that is, on the one hand, we need to understand what the prophets are saying to their contemporaries at their time under the set of circumstances that was relevant in their lives. It's specifically by our considering the message in that sense that we're able to understand what the prophet is saying and by extension what the prophet is also saying to us. Again, the words are directed to a particular audience and a particular set of circumstances. It's only by considering that, the audience, the circumstances, the time in which those words were stated, the time-boundedness, then, of those words, only thus can we really understand what the prophet is saying. Only by understanding what the prophet is saying can we also understand what the prophet is saying to us. But that means that the way we need to study the words of the prophets is not the same way that we study the words of the Torah. When we study the words of the Torah, considering historical circumstances, we will emphatically maintain is superfluous. When we study the words of the prophets, considering the historical circumstances, is never superfluous. It's a critical first step in order to understand what the prophet is saying, in order then to understand what the prophet is saying for us. Because it's solely by our appreciating the meaning of the words in their context, that we can see them in the broader context as indeed conveying a message to us as well and to all generations. I'm stressing this in particular because I think it is of utmost importance for us to consider this as background in addressing the first of the questions that we have here. So we begin again with question number one. Prophecies on the Messiah, part two. Christian believers see many prophecies in the Hebrew Bible as prophesying the coming of the Messiah and fulfilled through the life of Jesus. Do Jews see these prophecies as pertaining to the coming of the Messiah? Have they been fulfilled? Well, at this point, it should be clear that these last two questions, do Jews see these prophecies as pertaining to the coming of the Messiah, and have they been fulfilled, might both elicit an affirmative answer, yes, but for very different reasons. Because on the one hand, when we consider the words of the prophets, we need to recognize again that they were speaking most directly, most literally, most essentially to their contemporaries in their time. The words of the prophets, not in every instance, but in the overwhelming majority of instances, were fulfilled in their times. Again, we've already noted there are prophecies that were not fulfilled, either because we weren't ready for their fulfillment, such as the prophecies pertaining to the Second Temple, that was to have been the final restoration, but we failed to meet the challenge. And the prophecies that weren't fulfilled because of repentance that made prophecies of punishment no longer applicable. And furthermore, let's be very clear on this. There are definitely prophecies that can only be understood as essentially redemptive 
messianic, apocalyptic in their focus. When we read of the final battle of the forces of godlessness fought against God here in Jerusalem, the battle that is described in Ezekiel chapter 38 as the battle of Gog and Magog, the battle that is likewise portrayed in the final chapter, chapter 14 of Zechariah of Zechariah, that's a battle that hasn't taken place yet. That's a battle whose culmination is described in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, as, and God will be king over all the earth. On that day, God will be one and his name one. We yearn for that day. It hasn't come yet. So there certainly are prophecies that can only be understood as awaiting their fulfillment in the future. But, again, for the most part, we seek the meaning of the prophecies and their fulfillment in the events that take place at the time of the prophet. I think in particular, a prophet whose words are especially germane in this discussion, to whom we will be relating in the second question for today, is Isaiah. Isaiah himself lived on manifold planes in a very cataclysmic period. Isaiah lived at a time when there were many forces gathering upon the horizon, and not only upon the horizon, that threatened doom and destruction. And indeed, Isaiah witnessed the doom and destruction that befell northern Israel and other states as well with the rise and extension of the Assyrian Empire. Isaiah speaks of and witnesses the miraculous deliverance of Israel from the threat of Assyria and likewise from other threats, we'll be discussing another couple of threats shortly, that were taking place in his time. Many of the words of Isaiah should be understood specifically as describing the events that he witnessed, regarding which he prophesied, regarding which he had a very definite message that he imparted to the kings of Judah and the people of Judah. So, of course, on that plane, when we ask, have the words of the prophets been fulfilled, whatever Isaiah said with respect to those circumstances would have been fulfilled in those circumstances in his time. But does that mean that these prophecies don't pertain to the coming of the Messiah? And here, of course, inevitably, our answer needs to be informed by what we said before. The words of the prophets were directed to a particular audience, the prophet's contemporaries, a particular set of circumstances, the circumstances in which the prophet lived. But the words of the prophets, not merely because we choose to read them that way, but because God showed those words, that message, the image to the prophet that way, are there to teach us as well. So even to the extent that the direct object of the prophet's words is something happening in the prophet's life, as a general principle, Words of consolation, words of promise, words of hope, we unequivocally regard as expressed not only for the prophet's contemporaries, but also for us. Pertaining to 
a promise, not merely of the particular deliverance that took place at the time, but the final deliverance, the final redemption of the world that we still await to this day. So, the Jews see these prophecies as pertaining to the coming of the Messiah. Certainly. Not as the simplest basic meaning of the text, but rather because we recognize the text is multi-layered. There is the basic meaning of the text. The basic meaning of the text is first and foremost to understand what the prophet is describing in his time to his contemporaries. But that's not the only thing the prophet is saying. And once we appreciate that beyond that basic meaning, there are additional levels of meaning, whether we choose to describe those levels of meaning metaphorically as overlays that are accreted above the plain meaning, or maybe we should say the other way around, that these are levels of meaning that are beneath the layer, beneath the surface. We need to dig in order to discover them. Well, we'll leave that consideration for the poets, considering which metaphor is more appropriate. In some sense, they both are. Because again, we definitely regard the words of the prophets as both time-bounded and timeless, written on many different levels. But there is the plain meaning. And there are the additional levels of meaning. And they're both present. And of course, to that extent, it is critically important for us to bear in mind both of these levels of meaning. So, when we consider in summation the thrust of this first question, in particular, considering what, admittedly, Christian believers see in the Hebrew Bible as foretelling the coming of the Messiah and fulfilled through the life of Jesus. Let's be very clear here. On the one hand, you know very well the question of the messianic status of Jesus represents in this world an unbridgeable divide between Jews and Christians. We stand together respecting our differences, but by no means smoothing over the differences, pretending they don't exist. So obviously, to that extent, we Jews do not see those prophecies as fulfilled through the life of Jesus. But when you ask, are those prophecies given to us as pertaining to the coming of the Messiah? I think it would be fair to say that in the overwhelming majority of instances, the interpretation of passages in the Hebrew Bible as pertaining to the coming of the Messiah in Christian study of the Bible derived from an ancient tradition that already existed among the Jews that viewed those passages as pertaining to the coming of the Messiah as well. So in all, I'm going to reiterate my previous statement. Have they been fulfilled? They have been in the overwhelming majority of instances, fulfilled, having nothing to do with Messiah, in the sense that the baseline, the plain meaning of the words of the prophets was not messianic. It rather conveyed a message that was intended to the prophets' contemporaries. So with that as a starting point, let's consider a particular example. And I think the example is an excellent way with which to begin this discussion, although I freely concede that one example is going to be woefully inadequate in considering what this is going to be telling us. Question number two, how do you explain Isaiah chapter 9, verses 5 and 6? The King James translation has, and we'll be considering this translation at somewhat greater length 
shortly. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What is Isaiah describing in chapter 9, verses 5 and 6? Of course, inevitably, there's only one way to answer that question, and that is not to begin reading in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Rather, to that end, we need to go further back. We need to understand the context of the prophet's words, and although there are admittedly a number of different ways of understanding what the prophet is saying here, it seems most cogent, most compelling, and most coherent to understand chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, as a continuation of a passage that begins at the beginning of chapter 7. As a parenthetical observation, I should just point out, lest anyone be wondering, how can chapter 7 have to do with chapter 9 after all the different chapters? The answer, of course, is that the division of the Bible, with the prominent exception of Psalms, into chapters is, from our perspective, a relatively recent development that, in particular, from a Jewish perspective, is a useful convention but has no compelling thematic value. We already noted this in our discussion of Isaiah when we attended the discussion of Isaiah chapter 4 to chapter 3 because there really was no good reason for separating chapter 4 as a separate chapter. The division of the Bible into chapters and verses became, of course, popularized thanks to the printing press. It is unequivocally a tremendous convenience to be able to speak of a specific chapter and verse, even though, as we have had occasion to note in the past, there are to this day different versions of the division into chapter and verse. So sometimes we have a bit of trouble trying to figure out exactly what the number is of a given verse when we cite it. But in any case, when we consider thematically what's taking place, in this instance, returning to chapter 7, verse 1, is, I think, essential. So with that, let's begin chapter 7. Verse 1, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Yotan, the son of Uziahu, king of Judah, that Ritzin, the king of Aram, and Pekach, the son of Remaliahu, king of Israel, northern Israel, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now, I remind those of you who are following the series on Isaiah, that in our historical overview of the times in which Isaiah was prophesying, we noted the period of Ahaz as a particularly tempestuous one. There were indeed many threats to Judah, which we understand, thanks to the prophet, as a reflection of divine chastisement. God is rebuking Judah and its king, its king, by no means a paragon of righteousness, Ahaz, and punishing them. So there was an ongoing battle between the forces of Judah on the one hand and the forces of northern Israel allied with Aram on the other. They attempted to conquer Jerusalem and were unsuccessful. In verse 2 
and it was told the house of David, saying, Aram is confederate with Ephraim, Ephraim being a reference to northern Israel, and his heart was moved in the heart of the people, as the trees of the forest are moved with the wind. So there is this ongoing threat coming from the north and northeast, from northern Israel and from Aram. Then said God to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Sha'ar Yashuv, your son, at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool in the highway of the washer's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted on account of the two tails of these smoking firebrands. That is, that's all they are. They are not a threat to Judah. For the fierce anger of Rathim and Aram and the son of Rimalyahu. They're all fury, but there's nothing behind it. Because Aram Ephraim and the son of Rimalyahu have taken evil counsel against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and harass it, and let us make a breach in it for us, and set a king in the midst of it, namely the son of Tava'al. This is their plan. They're trying to depose Ahaz and set up, evidently, a puppet government that would be more congenial to what Pekach and Ritzin would be telling that puppet government to do. Thus says God the Lord, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rutin, and within 65 years Ephraim shall be broken in pieces and no more of people. And the head of Ephraim is Shamron, Samaria, and the head of Shamron of Samaria is the son of Rimalyahu. If you have no faith, you shall not be established. Now, when we consider what Isaiah is bidden by God to tell Ahaz, of course, on the most basic plane, pragmatic instruction, don't be concerned about these two kings attempting to do battle against you. Judah will persevere. And we should note further, Judah will persevere, not because of engaging in its own set of intrigues, its own alliances, its own confederacies, because of joining forces with Assyria or with Egypt. Judah will persevere because God will save Judah. That's a critically important message from the prophet. Simultaneously, that last line, if you have no faith, you shall not be established, can be understood as referring to multiple addresses of faithlessness. Maybe most conspicuously, Ahaz himself. And this informs the continuation of the passage. We are continuing to read in chapter 7, verse 10. Moreover, God spoke again to Ahaz, of course, through the prophet Isaiah, saying, Ask a sign of God your Lord. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. That is, if you have no faith in God's deliverance, from the forces of Aram and northern Israel, ask for sign, some great sign above or below, in order to convince you. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I try God. Which, of course, superficially sounds like a wonderful expression of faith, but given its source, it was nothing of the sort. 
It was more like a taunt. Oh, I'm not even going to bother. I don't take it seriously enough. Which, of course, occasions the response of God through the prophet. And he said, Hear now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, God himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the young woman is with child, and she will bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, when he shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread shall be deserted. Aram and northern Israel will be destroyed. God will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, namely the king of Assyria. The Assyrian Empire is ascendant. You don't need to reach out to them. They'll be coming soon enough. And if anything, it will spell disaster for Judah to attempt to form an alliance with Assyria. But Assyria will take care of Judah's enemies because of Assyria's own selfish interests. Now, what's especially important for us to consider in the passage that we just read is, you'll note that besides Isaiah, and Ahaz, there were two other people who were named here. Remember, one was Sha'ar Yashuv, to whom reference was made in verse 3, when God said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Sha'ar Yashuv, your son. So we know the first of these individuals was Isaiah's son. Then there's another individual, a child, Emmanuel. Who is Emmanuel? The truth is, we don't know for sure. Could be a son of the prophet as well. Could be, perhaps, a son of Ahaz, although the chronology would make it difficult to posit that Emmanuel is a name of King Chizkiyahu, who was Ahaz's son. But in any case, when we consider the circumstances of Emmanuel's appearance here, one thing is unequivocally clear. Emmanuel had to be a contemporary of Isaiah and Ahaz. Why so? Well, just consider how Emmanuel appears here. Remember, it is in the context of, in verse 14, God will give you a sign. You, Ahaz, a sign. A sign that you will be delivered from your enemies, the seeing king of Aram and Pekah, the king of northern Israel. And the sign is, the young woman is with child and she will bear a son and will call his name Emmanuel. Well, obviously, if the son isn't going to be born in time for Ahaz to be assuaged of his concerns regarding Aram and northern Israel, there's no sign. Indeed, obviously, this sign must be something extremely imminent considering that neither Aram nor northern Israel are going to be especially long-lived kingdoms once the Assyrian Empire begins sweeping west across Mesopotamia. So we have two children here, Sha'ar Yashuv, explicitly son of the prophet, Emmanuel, we don't know, but in context, it sure sounds like he's also a son of the prophet. 
certainly a son of someone of sufficient prominence that his birth would herald a sign for the king, Achaz. And we continue in the extension of the narrative with respect to what the prophet is telling Achaz is going to take place. I'm skipping because of our limitations in time to the beginning of chapter 8. Moreover, God said to me, take a great roll and write on it with a common pen. The spoil speeds. The prey hastens. And I took to myself faithful witnesses, namely Uriah the priest and Zechayahu, the son of Yedemechayahu. And I came near to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Well, obviously in context, this is another son of the prophet Isaiah. The prophetess is none other than the prophet's wife. And God said to me, call his name, well, in the Hebrew, it's Meher Shalal Chashbaz, the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. And here, once again, there is a message. For before the child shall know how to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Shamron of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So, another child, another sign. Note how the children of the prophet are explicitly cast in the role of signs for what is to take place. Well, this isn't the only example of the prophet having children whose names are particularly significant with respect to the content of the prophecy. Although we won't discuss it at present, I direct your attention to the beginning of the prophecy of Hosea, Hosea, and the children who are born to the prophet, in particular, in chapter 1, and their rather odd names that are also intended as signs. The prophet, after all, is a prophet of God, and simultaneously, also a family man. And on some planes, his family life becomes subordinated to his identity as God's messenger. So this then, in chapter 8, is manifestly a continuation of the themes that we already saw in chapter 7. Again, in chapter 7, it was God's message to the small-minded, non-believing Achaz, sit tight and trust in God. And Achaz wavers. He's not trusting in God. And the birth of Emmanuel is intended as a sign, and the birth of Meher Shalal Hashbaz is likewise intended as a sign. Now, in the verses that follow, we read of the cataclysms that take place in the land, after which, we read of the eventual deliverance and the great rejoicing that takes place in the land. And it is in the wake of that great deliverance, I realize that because of our time limitations, I'm skipping, and I certainly bid you to fill in the lacunas with your own study of the Bible, we get to the beginning of chapter 9. Once the battle is over, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, 
Upon them has the light shone. You have multiplied the nation and increased their joy. They joy before you according to the joy in a harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every shoe of the stormy warrior and every garment rolled in blood shall be burnt as fuel of fire. And the prophet, again, in context, first and foremost, plain meaning, describes the deliverance of Judah from its enemies. The deliverance of Judah from all of the cataclysmic occurrences that are taking place around it. And it's in that context that we get to verse 5. For to us a child is born. To us, well, inevitably, there is something of an ambiguity here. Who is us? In context, it certainly is plausible to say that it refers again to the prophet. It could also refer to the king Ahaz. That seems to be implicit in what we read in the following verse. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government is upon his shoulder. And his name is called Pele Yoetz El Gibor Avi Ad Sar Shalom. Now, the translation of these four names is indeed somewhat ambiguous. The translation presented by King James of wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, is certainly possible. With respect to these various descriptions simultaneously, they could all be seen, at least up to the last one, as names that describe God, which of course, on the one hand, shouldn't be terribly surprising to us because we are, after all, accustomed to things being called by God's name, even though it becomes perfectly clear to us that we aren't talking about God. Just consider the altars of which we read in the Torah. I'm considering in particular the altar that is built by Jacob upon coming to the city of Shechem. This in chapter 33 of Genesis, in verse 20, he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel, God, the God of Israel. Now, did he actually think the altar was God? Obviously not. He used the altar to serve God. But it serves as a means through which God's name is remembered. And in much the same vein, likewise, after the battle with Amalek in Exodus chapter 17, we read similarly that in verse 15, Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, Moses built an altar and called the name of it Hashem Nisi. God is my banner. God is my wonder, my miracle. So again, is it naming the altar God? Obviously, no one thought the altar was God. The altar was means for serving God. But calling something by God's name is a well-established practice in order for God's name to be mentioned. Moreover, here we certainly recognize that Pelio 8, the wonderful counselor, is a way of describing what God does. Likewise, 
the third and fourth words in Hebrew that King James renders the mighty God could perhaps better be rendered, El Gibo, God is mighty. You know, in Hebrew, the use of God's name in names given to people is almost ubiquitous. Starting out, of course, well, most obviously, with the name Israel, Yisrael, having striven with God. And all of the manifold names, Yeshayahu itself, Isaiah, God saves. So here, El Gibol, God is mighty. So that on that plane, we certainly recognize that these names, much as the names of the previous two children, maybe the previous three children, if Sha'ar Yashuv is also taken as a name given to child as representing the message imparted to the prophet Sha'ar Yashuv, the remnant will return words of consolation, this too can certainly be a name to be understood in the same context as the, as the other ones. A sign, just as the children of the prophet Hosea are signs of a very different sort, so too the children of the prophet Isaiah are signs, and their names are indicated as such. I should note there is an alternative way of reading the verse altogether, which would be that his name will be called by the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. It will be called the Prince of Peace. But in what context, the Prince of Peace? Again, baseline plain meaning of the text of Isaiah, plain meaning of the words of the prophet. We continue. The name is intended for the increase of the realm and for peace without end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever intended again, henceforth and forever. Not as something to take place in the remote recesses of the future. In the Hebrew, me'ata, from now on, clearly this child is personifying a message that is to be conveyed with respect to the dynasty of David, the house of David. Now, the time of the prophet, and forever, in the future. And we should note that it is undoubtedly still in this context that when we continue to read from chapter 9, verse 7 and on, the words of rebuke with respect to northern Israel, they should still be understood as a continuation of the same thing. It is, in some sense, thematically, a distinct passage, but it's a passage that is a continuation of what we just saw. That God sent a word against Jacob, and it will descend upon Israel, and all the people shall know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Shomron, of Samaria, that say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones, the sycamores are cut down, but we will change them for cedars. In other words, whatever we've lost, we will rebuild all the better. Therefore, God sets up the adversaries of Ritzin against him. Again, recall the context. Who is Ritzin? Ritzin is the king of Aram, ally of Pekah, king of Israel, and if Pekach and his cohorts in Israel are breathing easily, relaxed in confidence that thanks to their alliance 
with Ritin and Aram, all will be well with them. So again, the Prophet tells them, God sets up the adversaries of the team against him and goads his enemies, Aram before and the Philistines behind, and they devour Israel with open mouth. Aram is not going to be an ally. The other enemies are going to come up against Israel, and Israel is doomed. Referring again to the kingdom of northern Israel that is imminently doomed, the ten tribes facing destruction, and exile within the span of just a few more years. This is all part of a continuum. And again, the words of the prophet are clearly referring to the events that are taking place in his time, directed at the audience of his contemporaries, grappling with the circumstances that he and they were witnessing and these words are fulfilled, unequivocally fulfilled, in the geopolitical events that are taking place at the time, in the lifetime of Isaiah. So, of course, on the one hand, I could say this is how we explain Isaiah chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. We explain these verses not by taking them out of context, but rather by keeping them in context, and seeing them in the broader context of what the prophet is speaking about, what the prophet is teaching his contemporaries, and by extension, of course, what he's teaching us. Teaching us with respect to reliance upon God, teaching us with respect to not relying excessively upon people. Lessons that are undoubtedly of critical importance to every generation, maybe even especially our own. Are we finished yet? No. We're not finished. Because this perspective, while accurate, based upon everything I stated at the outset, is still incomplete. While we do learn from the prophet's messages, the prophet's teachings on that very basic meaning of the text. Lessons that continue to inform and illuminate our lives. We also recognize that there are these additional layers of meaning. Now if you ask me, these words of Isaiah, do they only apply to the time of Isaiah? Do they apply to the coming of the Messiah? My response necessarily is, to tell you the truth, we have an ancient tradition, an ancient tradition, in particular with respect to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. A way of seeing these words that pertains specifically to I shouldn't say the coming of the Messiah, more precisely, the potential of the coming of the Messiah. That is, verse 6, that speaks of the increase of the realm and peace without end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, henceforth and forever. The zeal of the God of hosts performs this in our tradition, describes a potentiality for the messianic deliverance, the final redemption, to have taken place then. That the righteous king, Hezekiah, Hezekiah could have been the Messiah. That great, awesome battle of Assyria, the forces of Sanhedrin, of Sennacherib, laying siege to Jerusalem, that could have been the final battle 
of the forces of godlessness against God and Jerusalem, especially when you consider the blasphemous pretensions of Sancheriv, of Sennacherib, and his emissaries when he sent them to Jerusalem to dishearten the people in the besieged city. Could have been. Wasn't. The time wasn't right. The people weren't ready. Even the righteous king, Hezekiah, the righteous king, Hezekiah, was not adequately prepared to actualize the potential of being that final redeemer. And so, chapter 9, verse 6 in our tradition signifies a potentiality. Could have been, should have been, might have been, was it? And I feel compelled to share with you my personal perspective. We are, of course, all very well familiar with the way Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is understood by the founders of Christianity as actualized in Jesus. Now again, I'm going to stress. My perspective here is a Jewish perspective. I'm going to maintain to the fullest extent possible a kind of objective detachment. You know very well that as a believing Jew, I do not believe at all in the messianicism of Jesus. But I think there would be a good deal of justification in considering that the apostles, the founders of Christianity, who, as believing traditional Jews steeped in Jewish scholarship, were undoubtedly aware of this ancient tradition regarding Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, as pertaining to the messianic potentiality that remained unactualized by King Chikyahu, saw this verse as signifying a potentiality that wasn't actualized in him, but that was actualized in Jesus. I'm stressing this point in particular. Because I think it's important for us to recognize on the one hand that, of course, the founders of Christianity, all of whom were traditional believing Jews and who were steeped with Jewish scholarship, would have been familiar with the ancient traditions of Israel. That, I think, is beyond dispute. Furthermore, I think perhaps even more critically, it is of utmost importance for us to bear in mind this verity they knew chapter 9 verse 6 was not in its plain meaning talking about the Messiah they knew that nothing in this passage beginning at the beginning of chapter 7 pertaining to Emmanuel as well could be understood in terms of its plain meaning as referring to the Messiah because the events that are described are the events that took place in the lifetime of the prophet himself. Emmanuel is an especially glaring example because Emmanuel is a sign for Achaz, remember. Does that mean that reading these verses as pertaining to Messiah is wrong? Inevitably, the answer to that question must bear in mind the multifaceted, multi-layered level of reading the text that we just discussed. Now, this is, granted, a much longer discussion, which is why we aren't finished yet, and there will be prophecies on the Messiah Part 3 as well. But this inevitably brings us to considering what is, in essence, the approach of Midrash. The approach of Midrash a classic, ancient approach to the words of the Bible in Jewish scholarship. Classic, ancient approach with which undoubtedly 
the founders of Christianity were well acquainted, is to read the verses of the Bible not only in terms of their plain meaning, but as intimating additional levels of meaning, precisely as we discussed earlier. The plain meaning of the text pertains to the events that are taking place in the life and times of Isaiah. On a deeper level of meaning, the text is intimating something that will only fully be actualized in the remote future. Words of Isaiah in particular have these manifold levels of meaning, these multiple layers. In our traditions, Isaiah is understood repeatedly as intimating both the events of his time, plain meaning, and the final redemption, the metrosic level of meaning. The reason this is so important is because it bears directly on our considering how we are to integrate what all of this means in the context of our discussion. And while further elaborating on this subject will undoubtedly take longer than we can accommodate in the time we have today, let me cut to a basic bottom line that responds not only to the question of how do you explain Isaiah chapter 9 verses 5 and 6, which we've already discussed, but perhaps a broader perspective on this discussion, this exchange, generally. You know, historically, one of the most contentious issues in what passed rather lamely as dialogue between Christians and Jews in the Middle Ages, the disputations that were generally forced upon Jews, was pretty much the template of the Christians saying, look at these verses in the Bible. They prove the messianicism of Jesus. And the Jews responding, these verses have absolutely nothing to do with the Messiah, they have nothing to do with Jesus, and this is completely nonsense. Now, of course, it should be clear to us that so long as the communication is on this level, they're talking past one another. No one is really communicating with anyone else. These are two interleaved monologues, not dialogue. I think it's important for us to appreciate the solution. And from my personal perspective, a crucially important basis of our being able to stand together, not because we agree. We're not going to agree here. We're not going to agree on the way we interpret Isaiah chapter 9 at all, at least when we get to this additional layer of meaning. But we can disagree agreeably once we recognize the level that we share is the baseline, the plain meaning of the text. The plain meaning of the text pertaining to the event that took place in Judah in the time of Isaiah. Everything else, everything else in Jewish tradition, everything else in Christian tradition, amounts to a midrash. Additional layers of meaning now, again, we're not going to agree with respect to those additional layers of meaning, but once we recognize that they were never intended as proofs because the plain meaning of the text could not possibly justify reading them as such, then contentiousness all of a sudden evaporates. These verses aren't intended as proofs of anything that would require being disproven. But simultaneously, if they're not proofs, you also don't need to, and in some sense, cannot disprove them, because rather than intended as proofs, they're intended simply as metrosic interpretations. You could choose to accept the interpretation. You could choose to reject it. 
when you do so, disagreeing, as we've expressed it, agreeably, respectfully. If I were to attempt to somehow make us all agree with respect to this additional layer of meaning in Isaiah chapter 9, or any number of additional passages as well, that could only be by trying to erase the differences between Jews and Christians, which would mean either making Jews less Jewish, or making Christians less Christian, or making all of us less everything. I hope it's clear to us all that is by no means my agenda. I believe God wants us to serve him as passionately and as faithfully as we can in our respective traditions. I believe, of course, on the one hand, that we're both grappling with the text as text, which, as I think you all realize, is the underlying premise of everything we're trying to do in Bible study, in Yeshiva Shashim. That is precisely this realization that we come together through attempting to understand what the words are saying before we get to the additional level of how additionally we interpret them. This is an important point for us to stress because I remember in my recent lecture tour in Europe, at one point, one of the questions that was posed to me when I addressed a large group of pastors was, are we reading the same Bible? Because after all, the way Jews and Christians read the Bible is very different. My response is emphatically, yes. Yes, the baseline is the same baseline. And moreover, the realization, returning to how we began, is that in order to understand what the prophets are saying to us, we need first and foremost to understand what the prophets are saying. On that, we can stand together, struggle together, understand the meaning of the words, the meaning of the words as the basis of the message. And when we get to those additional levels of meaning that I'll describe as Midrashic, we will respectfully disagree. But by consequence, we've established an awfully important foundation for our being able to stand together. Now I recognize there are many people, many Jews and many Christians, who will vociferously object to what I'm saying here. That is, many on both sides may object to my describing the founders of Christianity as engaging in Midrashic scholarship, as treating them as scholars of Jewish tradition. But of course, they were scholars of Jewish tradition. They were students of the traditions of Judaism, unequivocally so. Besides my not recoiling from speaking what I see as the truth, despite detractors who will object, again, I do feel there's a critically important agenda here, and that is to be able to stand together. Stand together while disagreeing, but with the realization that we can stand together on the foundation of God's word revealed in the Bible. And we can recognize that there are additional dimensions of meaning that are equivocal, that are subject to interpretation in which we can respectfully disagree. On that foundation, we recognize there are many words in the Bible that will teach us many things and many things about the Messiah. And we can indeed be students of the Bible, of God's word, together, heeding the words of the Bible, striving to understand them and integrate them into our lives without any additional agenda 
and recognizing as well that without any attempt of recourse to proofs or counterproofs, we could also respectfully disagree. We respect our many differences, but we respect that through God's word revealed, there is more that binds us together, through which we can connect with his blessings. God bless you.